My name is Jack Nelson. We're here at Fields Construction Services. We're going to have a seminar today on temper glass defects, and I'd like to introduce Dan Fields. Hello, everybody. Uh, this seminar will be on uh, tempered glass, uh, quality tempered glass, defective tempered glass, and uh, scratch glass issues related to tempered glass. Uh, before I get going here, I'd like to show a small slideshow showing some of the microscopic pictures of what uh, defective tempered glass looks like. This here is a window of a, of a bathroom in a house that was cleaned. And the scratches you see are a result of defects on the glass that were dislodged during the cleaning and created these scratching. This here is a microscopic shot, about a 200x of a fabricating debris with a scat scratch following. This is about a 50x, uh, the same thing, where you can see the has parallel scratches coming out of that defect. And here's another one. These images are from uh, past uh, analysis I've done on tempered glass. So we'll have several of them here. This scratch here is actually, was uh, probably cleaned in two different directions. You can actually see uh, two scratches coming out of this defect going in opposite directions. Same here. If you ever have scratching on tempered glass, this is what you're looking for to see if the actual scratch has a defect or fabricating debris at the beginning of the scratch. That's usually a tall tale sign of there's fabricating debris on that surface. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This picture here is actually one I have on the back of my business card and it's also on uh, my website, stopscratchglass.com. This, this image here is actually a picture of a defect in that lower left-hand corner by that uh, ink mark. I actually found this uh, piece of defect before we cleaned the glass, and I put them four black marks so I could track it after I cleaned the glass just to see what happened. And, and this is a result of that uh, defect where you can see the scratch coming out of the defect. Same location. And here's more defects. Usually when I handle a scratch glass case, we try to find any upwards of 50 to 100 defects on a piece of glass uh, so we can prove our point that the scratches are from defects. If more analysis is done, uh, we can go to a certified laboratory and get SEM uh, images, scanning electron microscope, and we can get composition analysis of the defect itself so we can prove exactly where the defect originated from before it was uh, fused to the surface of the glass during the tempering process. This is about a 200x here. You can pretty well clearly see that one on the right. That scratch is definitely coming from that area. Scanning an electron microscope, you can get much clearer pictures than this. This here was done by uh, a small microscope, a digital microscope off my laptop. Uh, if you go to a laboratory, they can go up to 50,000x, and uh, they're very clear through the scanning electron microscope. Okay. As I said, this uh, seminar is going to be dealing with uh, tempered glass mainly, uh, scratches on tempered glass, and how scratches uh, seem to be appearing on tempered glass more than any other glass in the industry. Uh, th there's a couple of fallacies out there on tempered glass and glass that is non tempered. Uh, a lot of people think that tempered glass is softer than non-tempered. Uh, that is not true. Tempered glass is the same hardness as non-tempered or annealed. 
a lot of people think t tempered glass is rougher to the feel or under a microscope it's rougher. That's not true either. Uh, tempered glass should have the exact same surface quality that anneal glass has. And that's where the problem comes in. Some tempered glass has a poor quality surface and that poor quality surface is what we're going to talk about here at the seminar. And uh, as I talked about in our other seminars, the construction seminar, if you leave with nothing else in this seminar, I would like you to remember to make sure you get waivers signed to protect you from tempered glass scratching if you do any construction window cleaning. This waiver will uh, go a long ways in helping you, help protect you during the uh, construction cleaning if the glass should scratch. So if you have scratching on a lot of tempered glass, uh, more than likely it's from the, the uh, poor quality surface on that tempered glass. Uh, especially if your tempered glass is scratching and your non-tempered or anneal glass is not scratching. And you're using the same methods, same scrapers, same construction debris, same person doing it, then it kind of points towards we might have a surface quality problem on the tempered glass. So uh, that's mainly what, th what this, is, uh, talk this seminar is uh, going to be covering. First thing we need to do is, is uh, describe what tempered glass is. T tempered glass is manufactured for safety. It's put in areas where safety is of importance. Tempered glass on most building codes are installed in patio doors. They're installed in side lights. Uh, here in California, anything within two feet of an opening on a patio door, that window has to be tempered. Anything that's within 18 inches of the floor has to be tempered. Stair landings, where you go up a stairway, make a turn and go up again, that landing has to be tempered if it's within four feet of the landing, the window. Bathroom windows have to be tempered if they're within five feet of the floor. And all shower doors and shower enclosures, it's required to be tempered. So if anyone should fall and, and run into the glass, the glass is four to five times stronger than anneal glass. Uh, years ago, they used to have demonstrations where you can take a baseball bat and actually hit, hit a patio door with a baseball bat and it wouldn't break. But yet, if you take the same piece of glass out of the frame, take a ball-peen hammer, and just tap this edge, it would shatter. So the whole idea of tempered glass is for safety. If it should shatter, it'll shatter into very, very small pieces, uh, which is what they call dicing. So when, when tempered glass is manufactured, it's manufactured, and it's positioned in areas to where you want to have it for safety. If it is required in that area, it's very important to make sure that the window cleaners that are doing windows, you get a rough idea of where you're going to run the tempered glass at. The codes aren't all exactly the same, but they're very similar. All doors have to be tempered, whether it's a patio door, or whether it be a French door, it has to be tempered. This problem that's been coming up, it is a problem that's been around for eight or ten years that I know of, and it's getting bigger all the time. It seems like there's more and more poor quality surfaces on some of this tempered glass, and it seems to be coming from certain manufacturers. And other manufacturers aren't having any problem at all. It's definitely a, a uh, quality control problem in the fabricating plant. That being said, the next thing we need to cover is how is tempered glass made? How is it fabricated? When, when tempered glass is fabricated, it's actually cut to the size of the finished product because you cannot cut tempered glass once it's tempered. And we tried to take a glass cutter and we insisted on cutting this it would shatter into a thousand pieces. You cannot cut it once it's tempered. So if you're going to temper, if you need a window that's this size, you need it tempered, you take a larger window, you cut it this size, you take a belt seamer or diamond wheel grinder, you grind the edges down. At that point, you take the piece of glass and you run it through a glass washer. As it comes out of the glass washer, it goes into a tempering furnace, 1150 degrees. As it comes out of the furnace, it'll get cool quenched air on both sides of the glass which sets the temper on the glass. And that process forms a compression layer on both sides of the glass and a tension layer in the middle of the glass. And that's what creates the temper. The problem arises 
is when some fabricators are not taking care of their uh, housekeeping and different things like glass washers, uh, furnace rollers, uh, air uh, cooling systems that have filters, they're not maintaining the, these pieces of equipment properly. Uh, the main one is the washer. When, when, when these, this glass is belt seamed to get the, ed the edges square to where it's not sharp and it's squaring off the edges, it does generate a lot of fabricating debris, which is glass dust and glass fines. What happens to that, it goes on both sides of the glass. So this glass is just covered with fabricating debris that needs to be washed off. The, the, the glass washing process is supposed to be serving that purpose. But on defective tempered glass, it's not getting the job done. The, the, the glass washer is not being maintained in the proper way. It might not be uh, emptied out often enough. The filters may not be changed enough. But the maintenance on that machine is not being kept up. And what happens is when all the fabricating debris is not cleaned off, it enters, it enters the tempering furnace along with the glass. When it hits 1150 degrees, this glass dust or glass fines actually gets fused onto the surface of the glass and becomes a permanent part of that glass. Then when you wash it, it will not wash off because it's actually become part of that glass. When window cleaners come across with scrapers to take off construction debris, they knock that defect off. And when they knock the defect off, you have what we showed in the, in the images where you have scratches coming out of every little defect. And that's what's causing the scratching. When scratching usually happens, it usually happens on the bottom surface of the glass, meaning when it goes through the tempering furnace. So when the glass, a piece of glass, this is an IG unit, so it's two pieces, but a piece of glass, as it goes through the furnace, will have what we call a roller side and an air side. The roller side is always the side that seems to have the worst, by far, amount of fabricating debris if you have this problem. One reason it has so much on that side is because glass that comes in that is contaminated leaves some of that fabricated debris on the rollers. So now you don't just have defective glass or contaminated glass, you also have rollers that are contaminated. So even if you do fix your glass washer, when this clean glass goes into your furnace, now the rollers are contaminated. So that's going to affect the bottom surface of your glass. And usually when we have tempered glass defect scratching, it's always on the bottom surface. When you're on a job site, you can usually identify that surface. And the way you can identify that is by the tempering stamp. Uh, years ago, and, and, and this, this window here is an old window, but, but years ago, uh, they, they didn't have a whole lot of different tempering stamps. The majority of them were down to either sandblasted or porcelain. Sandblasted tempering stamps are always put on the bottom surface of the glass. It's never put on top. So if it's a sandblasted tempering stamp, you'll always know that's the defective surface. If it's a porcelain stamp, they always put that on top of the glass. Because if they put it on the bottom, as it went through the roller, th through the furnace, the rollers would go bleep, 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 and it would smear the stamp. So porcelain has to go on top. So that identifies the quality surface. So the next question is, well, how do I know the difference between sandblasted and, and porcelain? The way you know the difference is a porcelain stamp is actually sitting on top of the glass. So if you take a razor blade and run it across, you'll feel it very easily. A sandblasted stamp that's on the bottom, if you run a razor blade across that, you won't feel anything because the, the sandblasted stamp is actually holes that were blasted into the surface of the glass. So your razor blade is just going to cruise over the top of the holes. You may hear it a little bit, but very little. And that's kind of how you can tell which side's which. And eventually, we, you need to get good at being able to track, tracking down tempering stamps and, and which side is which, and, and which side is the roller, and which side is not the roller. And that way you can track down exactly which side is defective. What I usually do when I go on a job is I will look at the side with the scratches on it, find out where the tempering stamp is on that one, and just go from there. If it's the same fabricator, it'll be the same throughout the whole building. But sometimes they do not keep, they, they, they'll flip the glass, sometimes for no rhyme or reason, sometimes they have a reason. 
On this IG unit I have here, I, uh, <clears throat> this is an old IG unit. It's about 10 years old. It was actually prior to low E coatings being popular. The reason I bring up low E coatings, because <clears throat> low E coatings nowadays are pretty popular. Here in California, almost all windows come standard with low E coatings. And the reason I mention low E coatings is because low E coatings are requiring IG unit manufacturers and temperers to start flipping their glass. Uh, back years ago when they first started low E coatings, they used to put the low E coatings on after the tempering process. And now they actually do it both ways. And then there's, there's a lot of it going on before the tempering process. But if it goes on before the tempering process, which is more modern, they can't let that low E coating be facing down the furnace. They don't want that low E coating up against some rollers, especially if there's a bunch of garbage on the rollers. So that it's important that that low E coating is facing up, which then tells you, okay, if the low E coating is facing up, then the fabricating debris or the poor quality surface or the roller surface is on the opposite side. Well, low E coatings, first of all, have to go between the glass. Low E coatings do not go on the outside. And before we go any farther, just so we have the right terminology here, when you're looking at a building, say we're outside the building looking at this IG unit, to identify the surfaces, this is surface one, surface two, surface three, and this is surface four. This would be inside the building, you could touch surface four. It's very important you, you, you know the surfaces. When the low E coatings started to become more popular, uh, here in California, in the nice warm state, they started positioning the low E coatings according to the weather or how cold or how hot the, the, the climates are. In warm weather, you always apply the low E coating on surface two. In cold weather, you apply the low E coating on surface three. And there's a reason for that. If you apply it on surface three, it does keep the house warmer where you don't lose the heat. If you apply it on surface two, on a warm area, it keeps the heat from going into the house as much. It, it just holds down the UV, the radiant heat. Okay, so that's the reason they, they do put it on different surfaces. Uh, without having a low E meter, which I have one, but without having one, you can pretty well tell where it's at by what climate it's at. When I get calls on scratch glass, I say, where are you located? And is that a hot area or cold area? And usually if they say it's a cold area, then I know the low E coatings are on surface two. Or three, I mean. Thank you. It would be on surface three. I can, there's one guy listening. Uh, so anyway, uh, years ago, like I say, this is, this is about 10 years old. Uh, this unit does not have a low E coating on it at all. So when I got this unit, I, I looked at it and it looked good. And the, and the fabricating debris on any windows is, is almost invisible. You can't see it with the naked eye. You need a microscope to see it. But I, but I looked at this IG unit. And I, and I ran some tests on it with, with some, uh, some razor blades. And if you run a razor blade across a quality surface window, you usually won't hear anything. Get my mic a little closer. I don't hear anything. So surface one's looking pretty good. Then I run it across surface four to see if I can hear anything here. I don't hear anything. Then I decided to open the unit up and inspect that. So I opened the unit up to, to surface two. Can you hear that? That's fabricating debris. And then surface three. Can you hear that? So on this unit here, the fabricating debris, this is a poor quality unit, the fabricating debris is uh, on surface two and three. And the reason it's on surface two and three because there's no low E coating. So the manufacturer, years ago, decided to put the poorer quality surface between the glass. It doesn't hurt anybody. Window cleaners don't care. Homeowners don't care. Nobody cares. Who, who cares if the garbage is between the glass? You can't see it. 
It won't scratch when you clean the windows because it's not on that surface. Everybody's happy. But when Lowy coating started to become more popular, that's when the problem started. And when the problem started is when the Lowy coating people said, okay, this window's going out to California, so we need to coat surface two. So they coated surface two with a low E coating, which is like a silver sputtering, so thin you can see through it. So they shot a low E coating on this, sent it out to the job, and when it got to the job, they looked at it, and it looked like there was sawdust between the glass. Very fine sawdust, but you could actually see something between the glass. And the builder's going, what is that? It doesn't look like they cleaned the IG unit before they put it together. And they were having problems with this. So they started sending a lot of this glass back to the IG unit uh, man, uh, fabricator. And so they took a couple of them apart trying to figure out what it was because they know they washed the glass and they, they discovered what happened was is they shot the low E coating on that defective surface. And when you do that, it does two things. The coating actually corrodes around them defects and makes it visible with the naked eye where now you can actually see the defect. And now we have a problem. We have a problem. So what some in the industry did is said, you know, what are we going to do? We have to do one of two things. We have to make sure this glass is pristine clean, which means we got to go back in our operation and check our washers and our rollers and, our, and take care of business. Or somebody had the idea why don't we just take this unit and turn it around and have it that way? This way here, we have a quality surface to apply our low E coating on. Looks great. You can't see any fabricating debris. Out on a job it goes. Everybody's happy. Well, almost everybody's happy. The, the window cleaners aren't happy. They haven't been happy for the last 10 years. The builders haven't been happy because what happens now, since this, this uh, defective surface is on surface one, it means it's exposed. It means when we clean windows, when we clean construction debris off of windows, we're going to break them defects loose and cause scratching on the glass. And it's going to look like we did it. But if you look close, as I've done in the, in the microscopic shots, you can actually see the scratches are coming from individual defects. When I first got involved in this, it was about 10, 12 years ago, and I was actually scraping windows when this first came out, when they started flipping these windows. And I actually believe that, you know, it does look like I did the scratches. Because when, when I scrape a window, I start my scraper here and I go, okay, and I, and I scrape the glass. And when I get, got back and looked, my scratches did the same thing. So that makes me believe, well, maybe it was me. And I didn't know anything about tempered glass and, you know, glass is glass. Until I started figuring out, well, wait a minute, it's only happening to the tempered glass. So when I figured that out, then that made me think, well, why does it only happen to tempered glass? And that got me doing research. And ever since then, I've been doing research, and I finally figured out what's causing it. Then I went back and I looked at my scraper scratches I was just mentioning, and I noticed that all my scratches didn't start here and end here, the way we all believe when we first see it, the way the bosses say, hey, I saw you scrape the glass in that direction. It had to be you. But if you look at the scratches, you'll find that they don't all start here and end here. If you look at them in the light, they all start from whatever defect that started the scratch. So the scratches up here, you may have five or six here, and 30 here, and 100 here, and 250 here, and as you follow it down, you'll see the scratches don't go the whole distance. They just start where the defect is. And if you get good sunlight, you can actually see that. Where you have a lot of parallel scratching going on, but they're not all starting at the same spot. And if it's a scraper, it all starts the same spot. That was one of the reasons years ago I took a scraper. They said I had a nick in my scraper. 
I took my scraper and I banged it up and, and put dents and stuff in it to show them, no, a scraper will not scratch glass. Even a dull scraper will not scratch glass. What's scratching this glass is these defects. So when I talk to different people across the country, and you're from Arizona, and that's a hot area, I say, don't tell me. Your scratches are on the outside, right? And they go, yeah, how'd you know that? I said, but they're not on the inside, right? No, no, they're not on the inside. Well, how could that be? When they're both tempered, and the outside's scratching, but the inside's not. Well, the reason that can be is because the inside, the poor quality of surface is right here. As you take that IG unit apart and run a razor blade across that, that's where it's at. So usually, they will try to at least leave the one surface facing in. It doesn't always happen, but usually they try to leave the one surface facing in. And in cold areas, it's just the opposite. I have a house up in Lake Tahoe uh, I bought a couple years ago, and all the timber glass is scratched. And it's all scratched on the inside. And it's from fabricating debris from years ago. The house is about 10 years old. But, but that's exactly what it's from. So when you have scratching on tempered glass, that's the first thing you want to identify. If you're in construction cleaning or even in, in any uh, window cleaning, if you're doing someone's house, a wash job, I know Jack mentioned this before, uh, all of a sudden you see scratches on some of the, the, the owner's windows, uh, think about it. Is it only on their tempered? If it's only on their tempered, you might want to bring them up to speed. You may not want to get involved, I don't know. But at least it gives you the information to explain what's going on, especially if it's a fairly new house. Say the construction window cleaner did it the first time, and then you're being called out to do it the second time, and the lady said, well, you know, I didn't hire the other guy back. Because, I mean, he scratched a lot of my windows. Not all of them, but he scratched a lot of my windows. Well, now you guys know. Were they all tempered? This might be the problem. And it should be taken care of. Anyway, that, that's one of the things we do uh, in my business here. We do consultations on that. About 40% of my time in this business uh, of mine, we do construction window cleaning. We do special services, tub repairs, window frame repairs, granite, marble, stainless steel, plastic. Uh, and a lot of my time is on scratch glass. Not especially from my guys, but builders in my area call me on scratch glass just to identify this problem. So I do highly recommend, if you, if you get anything out of this seminar, Make sure you get that waiver signed before you do any scraping, whether it's a wash job or construction. If you're going to pull out the scraper, get that signed. If you're working for a builder on, on new construction, I highly suggest you have him get his waiver signed from the window supplier. Just to let the window supplier know we're up to speed on this. We know there's different qualities of tempered glass out there. One thing before I forget. Heat treated glass is another type of glass that does go through the same process as tempered glass. Heat treated glass is called in a lot of commercial buildings. Heat treated glass is only twice as strong as annealed, where tempered is four to five. But heat treated glass does not have a tempering stamp. So if you're doing commercial buildings or storefronts or something like that that has heat treated, you may not have a stamp, but that doesn't mean it didn't go through the tempering process. The difference in the process is on fully heat treated, as it comes out of the furnace, cold quench air is blasted on it, a lot of it, and it's cooled quickly. Where heat treated glass, it's blasted on it, but it's heated, it's cooled much slow, more slowly. They, they don't cool it quite as quick. And that makes it stronger, but it doesn't make it fully tempered. The, uh, uh, when Heat strengthened glass breaks. It'll break almost like regular anneal glass. It doesn't break in small pieces. So when you need strength, say for a skylight or something, if it breaks, it breaks, but you don't want it to fall out of the opening. So there's different reasons why they have different things. For example, your, your windshields in your car. That's also a safety glass, but it's not heat strengthened at all. It's actually laminated. And the reason they laminate is because you have the strength but yet, if, if, it, if it catches a rock, it doesn't shatter into a million pieces to where you can't see out of your windshield, or the thing will come in on you. So, so your windshield is laminated, but your other, the side lights and, and the rear light is, is a tempered window. If you break it, it'll shatter into a bunch of pieces. So your waiver needs to say heat-treated glass, not just tempered. And like I say, I have these waivers on my website. It's uh, stopscratchglass.com. And uh, your association has it too, Master Window Cleaners of America. 
IWCA is, is coming up to speed on this very quickly. And I'm very glad to see that. They have some bulletins on there you guys might want to take a look at. Uh, Gary Maurer it, it is another guy that's been helping lead the way on this. Uh, he deserves a lot of credit. He's got a website, uh, scratched-glass.net. He's got some very good one-page articles. Uh, I'll take the time to, to, to check that out. Uh, Martin, can, can we see them other images of the, what I did on this here, we have some images to show. This here is a brand new razor blade. Uh, originally it was a 10X, but obviously it's bigger than that here. Uh, with nothing on it, I just pulled it out of the package. This is after I drug it across uh, this window, and that's fabricating debris you see on there. This here is just the edge, the sharp edge, that dark part is just about less than a sixteenth of an inch when I took a picture of it, and that's the brand new also. And this is the fabricating debris we got off of it, and this is about a 50X, the original was. This here is a 100X of the brand new razor blade. And that's the fabricating debris. And it's kind of obvious, it's kind of obvious when you see these pictures, you, you put that razor blade on a clean piece of glass, you should come up with nothing. What is this? This is stuff that we are actually uh, breaking off the glass that was fused to the surface. And this is 200X. And that image there is just the very sharpest edge of the razor blade but it's, it's pretty clear. And like I say, you can run uh, at a certified laboratories, which I've done. We, we've done, we've ran uh, scanning electron microscope images of this, and we've got uh, composition analysis to figure out what is this stuff. And uh, we actually came up with uh, most of it is the edge grindings from the glass, because we took the analysis of the actual glass itself and took the analysis of this, and they matched perfectly. There's other things that are mixed up in there sometimes. It might be insulation from the furnace roof or other things get involved. And when I first started on this, I used to say it's glass fines or glass dust. Well, they actually proved to me, well, not all of it is. Only 98% of it is. I, actually, there's some other stuff in there, too. So I, I stopped saying that, and now I just say fabricating debris. Whatever it is, it don't belong. This is just fabricating debris by itself on a black substrate, and that's a 50X. And that's a 100X, and that's a 200X. That in there you can really see, especially the one down at the bottom in the middle, I mean you can see it, it looks like a big old piece of glass. This is the same one that we showed once before, it's a defect before I ran the blade and this is after I ran the blade. So I mean it's pretty, most of the websites and most of the people who have information on this include that on their site because it's, it's, it's pretty conclusive. That's where the scratch came from. That is the, the biggest part of, of uh, what we have here on the tempered glass issues. I'd like to open it up to questions, see if anyone has any questions on this. And, uh, Jack? Um, is there anything that we can say to uh, the contractors about they've already accepted the glass, they've already put the glass in the window, and now we find fabricating the blade, the, the, I'm sorry, debris. The, uh, the best thing that I think we can do for our builders, uh, especially when it's already in the unit, uh, it, it's, it's too late to do anything about it, is number one, you hand them your waiver. And, and, and I, just, you know, I had to start out with CYA, but uh, you need to hand them your waiver and, and, and take you out of the problem. Uh, most of the people that I do consult, uh, consultations for, uh, unfortunately, they try to get in between uh, the builder and the supplier. And, and, and the problem is, is you have a supplier that, that's supplying possibly inferior products, defective products, uh, which is liability on his part. You have a builder on the other side that realistically in new homes, why isn't he covering the glass up, you know? Why isn't he enforcing his subs to cover the glass up? So there's a lot of liability there. Then all of a sudden, we come by as window cleaners, and we're going to help them out, like I discussed in, in the last uh, seminar, when there's so much debris on the glass, it's in everyone's specs, plaster, painter, texture, everybody's specs. You need to cover up 
what's in your area so, so you don't destroy other people's work. Why wasn't that done? So you have them under liability. They should be held liable for this. But yet here you come along as an innocent party, you take off the plaster that shouldn't be there, you take off the paint that shouldn't be there, and you take off the fabricating debris that shouldn't be there, and that's what causes the scratching. And for doing all that, you get the bill to replace all the glass. So I start out with, get the waiver signed. Even if you go out there and it's too late for the builder, it's too late for the builder. It's not too late for you. But that being said, all you can do at that point is, is uh, bring him up to speed on what's going on. And, and what I would do with my builders is I say, the decision is yours. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to, to clean these windows or do you want me not to clean these windows? I'm not going to get into the liability end of it. So, so if he wants you to clean these windows, but, but he wants you to not use a scraper, when builders tell me that, that, that's the only way I clean windows. When you see, see the windows that we cleaned earlier, how are you going to clean that without a scraper? You know, I have 65 window cleaners right now. If all of a sudden all my builders wanted their windows clean without a scraper, they'll pay me anything, but they need me to clean without a scraper. I'd need 650 guys. It just can't be done. And the bottom line is, I think the easier you make it on builders, what happens is then it's not a problem. They don't fix it. Anytime you make it easy, they don't fix it. That's why I, I want to do what I can, but I don't want to put myself in the liabilities chair trying to bail them out. And, and, and if you let them make the decision, okay, uh, Fields, what we need to do is go ahead and scrape them. Or wait a minute. If you have the knowledge to be able to explain to the builder what's going on, the builder really doesn't have a problem because the builder just gets you and the, the uh, supplier together and him. He says, come here, we're having a problem. We can't clean this glass. And he lets the supplier know what the problem is. He says, now how are we going to clean this glass when your fabricating debris makes it to where we can't clean it? And of course they say, well, you shouldn't use a scraper. Well, that's fine and dandy to have one glass association tell window cleaners not to use scrapers after we've been using them. I've been using them personally for over 40 years. And my dad used them before me, and his dad used them before him. So all of a sudden we have one glass association out there that all of a sudden says, oh, by the way, Set down all your scrapers. Set down all your scrapers. They don't have that right. Just because there's a few tempering fabricators that can't seem to put out a quality product, that's not our problem. If the builder understands this, the builder will say next time when he buys windows, we will not buy their glass, we're going to buy their glass. And if the window manufacturer says they have no choice, that's not a problem either. Then instead of buying your windows, we're going to buy somebody else's windows where we do have a choice. And it doesn't matter much on a custom house or on one house, but the builders I work for build 35,000 houses a year. And believe me, it doesn't matter what any glass association says. It doesn't matter what ASTM says. It doesn't matter what President Bush says. That builder calls the shots. He's got his standards. And if you don't do what he wants to do, he will not use you. He will not buy your product. And that's the buying power. And the dollar will make the decision in the end. And that's why it's important. The builder has to step up and say, we are not going to buy that glass. Or he's going to continue to buy that glass. And if he chooses to continue to buy that glass, then he has a problem. But you can try to help him out saying, hey, why don't the three of us get together? That's usually what I do. And all my builders, they sign my waiver. And I say, but when you have the problem and it gets big, feel free to call me. I won't pay for it. But I will explain to everybody and expose everybody at the meeting so everybody knows what's going on. The glazer can't say, well, this glass is softer. Didn't you know that? Or this glass is rougher. You know? Or this glass is on the west side of the house. That's the problem. You don't see any scratches on the north side of the house. That's because there's no sun on the north side of the house. See? But yet when you get people there that have been down the road a few times, everyone's going to have to fess up. Everyone's going to have to admit what's going on here. And to take the scrapers out of the window cleaner's hands, that doesn't solve a thing. Even if the builders cover these windows 100% and we just have to wash them, what happens when the homeowner puts Christmas decorations or the, or the foam on the windows and the different things they enjoy doing? Then the poor residential window cleaner is going to come along, a little one, two-man operation that doesn't know anything about this. He's going to charge an extra $8 to take off this lady's stuff and he's going to end up buying a whole house full of glass. So bottom line is, it's just an inferior product. And builders need to know 
It's your decision. Especially when tempered glass all runs about the same. It isn't like we have high priced tempered glass and cheap tempered glass. You can go from one end to the other on pricing of tempered glass and it's all fairly the same price. So, so it isn't like we're saving a buck here. So the, I would say that that's the best thing you can do. But to get the waivers going. Make sure he knows about the waiver. So it's a problem for him on this house. But if he understands it and you show him his waiver, he'll make sure the next glazer comes wheeling through there, signs that, and that gives the, that gives the, the uh, glazer a heads up. We know what's going on, so don't put no garbage in our windows. Okay? And that, um, that other waiver you were talking about, it's available on your website? Yeah, that, that is available on my website, and I'm sure it'll be available on uh, uh, your website here shortly, too. It's, it's also going to be on the IWCA website. It's, it's heading that way now. Uh, so the billers have a way to go with this. I've had a lot of my billers request, uh, Dan, we signed your waiver. You're out of the loop. You're protected. But how do we protect ourselves from arguing with the glazer? Because they don't want to argue either. They don't want to get me out there with my microscope and, you know, say, have everyone look and, oh, yeah, there it is, you know. We don't want to argue about it. So I said, all you need to do is get a waiver. So I wrote up a waiver for them. And, and it lets them know well, when a glazer comes out to bid a house, I have a house and I need all these windows, you have different window manufacturers that will come out and say, okay, I want to bid your job. And the builder will say, okay, I want IG units and I want vinyl frames and I want double locks and I want this and that and the other thing. And oh, yeah. I need you to sign this waiver saying your tempered glass is something we're going to be able to clean. And if we have this problem and it scratches because of the fabricating debris, you're signing here, you're taking full responsibility financially and to replace the glass. And when, it, when a glazer sees that, they go, what's this? And if you've done your jobs and gave the builder plenty of information, just give them the websites. That's all I do. I just give them the websites. And they look it up and they go, man, I, I just can't believe it. This has been going on for years. I've had builders, two years ago, I had a builder call me $1,200 a house he was paying. And just one of the customer service guys ran across my website and called me up and I went out there. In an hour and a half, it all got straightened out. They invited the, the glass supplier out and we all talked and uh, solved the problem. And uh, the glazer stepped up and he, he did pay for it though. But the problem stopped. So that's why I think it's a good idea, the Home Building Association. I know a lot of us are joining home builders uh, just so we can help them, which helps everybody. Homeowners and building owners deserve quality glass. And we can help them get it. You believe that this problem actually could be eliminated? This problem is definitely avoidable. And I say it's avoidable because most temperers don't have this problem. A lot of the big glass manufacturers who manufacture glass do not have this problem. They do, they do small things like they have uh, pre-wash areas in front of their glass washer. It's like a little car wash nozzles. And they have a whole row of them both on top and on bottom as you feed the glass into the washer. It blows 98% of this junk off before it even goes into the washer. And that keeps them contaminating your washer. And then, and then they empty the washer every 24 hours. They do so many different things to make sure this doesn't happen. And the low E coating has made it even more critical. Like I said before, before they didn't care. And neither did I, because they put it between the glass. Not a problem for anybody. But when the glass industry came out with a new product, everything changed. But they flipped it and gave us the problem. And they, I've heard them say now that uh, they can't help it now, because they're, they're, there's tempering uh, low E coating you know, when it's on the glass, they put the low E coating on the glass before they temper it, and it has to face up. Well, whether it does or not, I don't know. I'm sure it does. But why is the bottom still defective, though? Especially when there's so many tempers out there that got it right. And the IWCA has a temper that's very interested in helping us out. Very interested in on, on bumping up the quality, which I think is great. Anytime we can get any glass people or any temper involved in this to support the builder's effort, not our effort, the builder's effort. He's all of our clients. He's the one paying the bill. He needs to know about this. And like I say, IWCA has, has a glass company, a fabricator that's stepping up. And I think that's great. Once we get a few fabricators pulling away, they'll start bragging about their quality. Not one now brags about their quality. Even the big ones don't, that I was saying, the glass manufacturers. 
But the reason they don't brag about their quality is because they sell raw glass to fabricators. And if the fabricators are, are putting out poor quality products, how can they bash them? Because if they do, they'll lose the client selling them glass. Because some of these high quality tempers are also manufacturers of glass. I say, why don't you boost your, your quality? Say, hey, w w we give you quality glass. They can't because they sell to some of these people. That's their customer. I guess, but in my opinion, uh, like I said, we have to take care of the builder. But get that waiver signed first. That you do not forget. Keith. The question on, on the microscopic pictures that you have, you have a, of the razor blade. Have you ever seen a microscopic picture of a razor blade after it's gone over some of that debris and the nicks that and, and chips that it does put in like just like a shovel? And when you flip that over, it does not that scratch glass? You mean uh, the, the one I ran across with all the debris on it? Clean the debris off and look at it again? Any debris, like the okay. debris you cleaned off of these windows, right. if it's hard on there hard enough, if it's concrete especially, Right. Uh, it's going to have to chip or nick that, that razor blade, bend it back like it would on a shovel, an aluminum shovel. Right. If right. you flip that over, it seems to me that that sharp edge is going to be there to scrape. Right. I train our guys not to flip their razor blades over, right. that they're always going using the same side, so that right. there is a nick in it and they flip it, don't flip it over, they're not going to run that risk. Right. Uh, as far as nicks on a razor blade, it wouldn't make any difference. L l like I said earlier, you, you can actually take, and I'm sorry I didn't bring one or I'd show you, uh, you can actually take a razor scraper, razor blade, a putty knife that I use, and you can do whatever you want with it. File it, make sure it's clean first to start with so there's no rust. But beyond that, you can put as many nicks in it as you want, and, and the nicks will not scratch glass. It's not hard enough to scratch the glass. The only reason this stuff, the, the fabricating debris is scratching glass, because it is glass. See, it is glass. You can take little dust of glass and go like this, and it, it just scratches big time. Well, that's what these little particles are. It's fused to the surface. And I don't have any uh, pictures of it here, but if you actually take a microscopic shot of one of them defects, you can actually see when you hit it, you either knocked off the top half of it, and that's where it starts scratching from that point on, and you can actually see where you knock the top off, or some of them you hit it, and it actually tears the whole thing off, and there's a little crater there. Like I say, these pictures aren't high-powered enough, but an SEM will show all that to where the, the scratch actually comes from that. This stuff here, or on cons, uh, construction cleaning like you're talking about, that's one reason why I use the phosphoric acid, because it's hanging onto the glass only by the cement that's in the concrete. Once I use the phosphoric acid, it dissolves that cement, and there's nothing making it hang on. Where these defects are actually fused to the surface, it's actually part of that glass, because when it goes into the furnace at 1150 degrees, it actually melts that little defect. It melts very easy because it's so small. It's like sugar, and it just melts it right to the surface. Now it's part of the surface. So then when you hit it, you break it off and drag it from there. Not every defect will cause, will, will, not every scratch will have a defect at the end of it. If I had a thousand scratches here, I could track them back to a defect, but some of them won't have the defect because I have these loose pieces of glass floating around that I'm catching with my scraper. But the glass industry would like to blame the scraper, saying, well, What's causing this is, is the scraper. And, and when they brought this up years ago, they said, well, it's easy to solve. We have to do this, because that's the way low coating is. Sorry. What you got, you guys have to change the way you're doing things. And what you need to do is use a plastic scraper. I'm going, plastic scraper? You can't do construction when you clean with a plastic scraper. But that, that's what they wanted us to do, because they were convinced it was, the plastic, it was the metal scraper. So I bought a six inch plastic scraper. And I had a tempered window like this, and I cleaned it and looked good. I tested it. Yeah, fabricating debris was there. I said, watch this. And I did this at a, at a seminar. I ran the plastic scraper, wet it, ran it across the glass, wet it and squeezed it, and it scratched it just like the razor blades did. Because even the plastic scraper is hard enough to snap these things off. But now, I took a microscopic shot of the edge of my scraper. Now all that garbage, or a lot of it, is embedded into the edge of my scraper. Now I get to take that scraper I have and use it on every window in the house and scratch every window in the house, and now the scratches will start here and end here. See what I'm saying? So that creates another problem. So from that point on, everybody's been just as quiet as a little church mouse about using plastic scrapers. 
it was a silly idea anyway. But I showed them what the problem was. And from that point, they said, well, OK, no scrapers. Well, that's easy. You know, We'll just stop using scrapers, right? And carpenters can stop using hammers and nails. And you know, we don't know how you're going to do it. Just stop using them. And that's what we're being asked to do. We don't know how you're going to get this construction debris off. It shouldn't be there anyway. So you know, tell your builder to make sure he, you know. Bottom line is, we have defective glass, and we have a builder that is not protecting his windows. Stay out from in between them. You can help if they're willing to listen. But a lot of them aren't willing to listen, and a lot of them are looking for someone to delay the bill on. And I've been doing this for so long now, now I don't even argue anymore. Now, when people call me to do the work, I need a waiver. That's the first thing I say. If you're not going to sign the waiver, then there's no sense even talking. And I have lost jobs because they don't want to sign the waiver. So they hire another window cleaner. He doesn't require a waiver. He scratches the glass. The contractor breaks him. So he hires another window cleaner. And he scratches the glass. The contractor breaks him. And another window cleaner. And it just keeps going. Until eventually someone says, hey, wait a minute. Didn't Field say something about that? Well, why don't we listen to him again? So the second time I tell them and I show them the information, they listen to it because it has become a problem for them. Because most window cleaners, the vast majority, do not have insurance for scratch glass. I don't have insurance for scratch glass. Like I say, we do 4,500 houses a year. I don't have a penny's worth of insurance for scratch glass. It's very expensive. And most window cleaners don't. So if you have a window cleaner with $100,000 worth of scratch glass, do you think he's going to be able to pay that? No. So the builder ends up eating it. So eventually the builder will come around. Say, you know, if this is this simple to fix, why don't I just switch tempers? He's going to do it. Because this is major. Another question on scratches. You say you've, you've, you've identified enough scratches in your time with this that what then does cause one little scratch on a window here and another one in that window over there? Usually it, it will be a grain of sand. You know, from the scraper or from, it might have been there before you even started. You know, some scratches come on the glass when it gets there. It might be from lathing paper. It might be from someone leaning the ladder on the, on the window. It could be from a thousand different things. I was trying to scratch a window out here the other day with a screwdriver and I couldn't do it. And, and finally I just, I wet my finger, stuck it in the dirt, and just went like this. And it just, 30 scratches, man. So, so uh, glass does scratch very, very easily. But it's also very, very durable. It's very hard to scratch in a lot of ways. But in other ways, it is very easy. One grain of sand. That's why I said with the strip washer. That's a disadvantage using a strip washer. Because it, you get so much sand in there, and there's no way to get it out. I mean, you, you can rinse all you want with the strip washer, and it's hard to get all that stuff out. Especially as much plaster as I had on these, this glass. I mean, there, there's no way I would even attempt that. But like I say, it should be covered. And it's not. The reality of the situation, it's not covered. OK, another question? Dan, in a situation where all the subcontractors have been diligent in protecting and covering the glass, um, whereas you would normally want to simply wash it, do you still test the glass uh, just for the um, knowledge and benefit of the builder? Uh, I usually don't don't uh, do that. But like I say, all I do is, is construction window cleaning. Uh, what I do offer to my builders, though, and I offer to all of them, uh, usually my builders uh, build model homes first. If they have a 100-house track, they, they'll build four or five model homes. If they're aware of this problem, they'll usually have me come out uh, when the glass is delivered, and, and I will test a bunch of it for them. I know uh, now which ones we usually have problems with and which ones we don't. So if it has a certain fabricator, tempering fabricator, I'll tell them, you know, you're okay. Or if it has a, another fabricator that I know there's problems with, I'll tell them I better check it. And, and if it's, it's a problem, I will bring him up to speed at that point, right at the, at the model stage. And then at that point, he can make a decision whether he wants to bring out a supplier. We, we could have a meeting, talk it over before we continue building the other 95 houses. Uh, but that's something you can definitely do for your builders. And if you do that, you'll find out that the, that the builders raise their respect for your knowledge, especially when you're coming on the job, telling him things that, that his glazers don't even know about. 
or to tell them things that his window manufacturers don't know about and his suppliers and distributors don't know about. And here you are a, a window washer and you're not just educating him, but you're also showing that what's wrong with this product. And it'll definitely move you up on the, on the scale. A lot of my builders uh, hire us just for that reason. If this problem comes up, it's not a problem for them. They'll, they sign my waiver, it's not a problem. Because they know, damn, we got a problem, come on out here. And they'll invite the supplier, the distributor, window manufacturer, whoever it takes, and say, we've got a problem, what are you going to do about it? And when I show them what's going on, and, and they can hand me or hand the builder this new glass association bulletin saying, well, you can't scrape glass, he's not going to buy that. He's going to say, I want glass we can scrape. Because scrapers are a standard for construction window cleaning. They've been that way for over 50 years. They were that way before tempered glass was required. Tempered glass wasn't required until 1977. They had it before then, but it wasn't required. And we've been using scrapers well before that. So to have someone say you can't use scrapers, well, my builders say, well, we want to be able to use scrapers. So if we can't use it on yours, thanks a lot. Well, buy someone else's. And you'd be surprised how quick they come around. But as far as wash jobs itself, uh, if you're not using a scraper, there's nothing to worry about. I, I have yet to see any problem uh, unless there's some type of scraper used, plastic or steel. Something hard enough to knock that, knock that defect off. My question also centered around the fact that if initially you don't have to use a scraper, you can simply wash, are you just delaying that problem? There might be a time when um, there's an interim time when uh, the next person on the job needs to scrape and that's when it'll be identified. Without a doubt, you are definitely prolonging the problem. Uh, it's only a matter of time before someone's going to come through there when they repaint the building or it's a homeowner, they want to put decorations on their glass, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. Uh, and, and definitely some unsuspecting window cleaner is going to come cruising through there for 60 bucks he's going to clean that house and it'll cost him 6000 before he gets out of it. And obviously, he's not going to have the insurance, but that's okay. The homeowner will say definitely it's obvious he did it. I mean, we saw the scratches. Right? Yeah. He doesn't know. So he's figuring, hey, maybe it was This has never happened to me before. I get calls every week from window cleaners from six months in the business to 30 years in the business. And every one of them say the exact same thing. This has never happened to me before. But I ran across the website or I ran across uh, the Masters Association or IWCA or Gary's site. This is unbelievable. And unfortunately, a lot of them don't have the know-how. They don't have the knowledge and they pay. That's why I tell window cleaners, especially construction window cleaners, take this dead serious. You don't get that waiver taken care of, it will break you. If 50,000 ain't enough, not a problem. Next time it'll be 300,000. I, I did a case that took four years, it just got settled last month, it was two million. They'll gladly take your house and your car and your kids and your wife and everything else. You need to get the waiver signed. We can win without a waiver but it's going to cost you big dollars in, in laboratory costs, 350 an hour, lawyers cost, 350 on up an hour. Now as you work uh, for nothing until we get the thing rolling, as most of you guys already know. I do a lot of consultations for window cleaners to, to try to get them up to speed. If it goes to litigation, then obviously they have to hire me or if I have to fly all over the country. But yes, just because you didn't have to scrape doesn't mean some unsuspecting person along the line. And that is my number one goal on, with Jack here and with the other associations is to get that word out to all window cleaners. Be careful. There's something out there that's going to put you out of business. And nothing will put you out of business quicker than this. So take it dead serious. Uh, Craig. Yeah, uh, you said tempered glass came into effect or was uh, mandatory as of 77. Yes. What about float glass? We're going to cover that in the next seminar, too. Uh, float glass is actually uh, glass that is manufactured nowadays. Float glass is, is, a, is the, uh, the process of how glass is made nowadays. Almost all glass made in the United States now is float glass. And what float glass is, and I'll go into this in more detail on the next seminar, but the float glass is, is actually glass that is, uh, and all the ingredients to glass is heated up in a melt tank. It comes out of the melt tank and it actually floats on molten tin. And as it floats on molten tin, 
that's what creates the flat surface on top and bottom. As it comes out of the, the float tank, it goes on to an annealing layer, and that's where the glass is actually cooling and forms in the glass. And, and this, this uh, annealing layer, the whole operation is like a quarter of a mile long. I actually saw one at Fresno a few years back, and it's, if you ever get a chance to go to a, a glass manufacturing plant, uh, don't pass it up. It, it is something to see. Uh, this ribbon, it's a glass ribbon they call it, it's like 14 feet wide and almost a thousand feet long. And the way they, they uh, adjust or determine the thickness of glass is by how fast they're pulling this glass out of the float tank. So if they need half inch glass or three quarter inch glass, it comes out very slowly. If they need the eighth inch, it'll come out a little faster. If they need microscope slide glass, that stuff is flying out of that thing. And these float uh, manufacturers actually operate these systems for 10 years nonstop. 24 hours a day. I mean, they're, they're a huge operation. Like I say, if you ever get a chance to go see one of these, don't pass it up. It, it, it's, it's some operation to see. Now, the one I saw was in uh, PPG. And uh, it was, it, like I say, it was, it was very, very entertaining to see it. Uh, and after 10 years, they do break it down and, and start over. But these plants turn out like a 600 tons a day. 600 tons a day. A lot of glass for 10 years, nonstop. But anyway, all, all glass is uh, float glass. And uh, we'll talk more about that on the next seminar. Any more questions? Kim? You've determined that you, once you've determined that you have fabricating debris, what's your procedure about cleaning it from that point, uh, from that point on? If, if it's in a construction environment, I, I think uh, Jack covered that part of that. If it's a, in a construction environment, I know I have a, a problem with this surface and there's a lot of paint and plaster and everything on this. My company, we don't offer any other way to be able to take it off. And, and uh, for a couple of reasons. One, if, if, if I decided to do as, as some in the glass industry want me to do and just, just kind of be gentle and pluck off every little piece, I mean, that's going to take me you know, two hours a window and I don't think the builder wants to pay that. And I don't have the manpower for that. I, I would need to go 10 times the manpower I have now. And I, I just don't want to go into that business. And second of all is, is I think if the builder understands what's going on, the builder will get the fabricator out there and say, listen, we have a problem here. And uh, get everybody involved and say, OK, the builder might say, OK, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let the window cleaner clean them. If he scratches it, I'll, I'll replace the ones that are scratched. But I don't want to have this happen again down the line. He may cut a deal that way. Most people that I've represented, in the end, there's deals made behind the lines. Either the builder pays for some of it, because as I told Jack, there's some liability. He should have made sure they were covered. The, 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 the supplier or the distributor will eat some of it, because he doesn't want to lose the builder as a client. The fabricator is probably going to donate the tempered glass, but he's not going to install it, so maybe the supplier will install it. But there's, they do divide up the bill to try to solve it. But my point is, why should we have any of the bill? So before you throw a knife on it, you need to let them know, I'm doing you a favor, even taking your construction brie off there. That alone is a favor, because it shouldn't have been on there to begin with. Read, read your contract for your plaster and painter and everybody else. That way it gets you out of that liability loop. I've had builders years ago, <coughs> years ago that wanted to suggest splitting the bill. And I refused to. I said, if I scratch the glass, I don't want you three guys paying each a fourth and me paying a fourth. If it's my liability and my fault, I'll pay for the whole thing because it's my fault. And I've done that before. I've bought complete houses of, of carpet where my guys stained carpet and we couldn't match it. And You know, you've got to stand up for your, the liability. If it's your fault, you pay for it. But that being said, if it's not your fault, you don't pay for it. And I've lost jobs because I won't pay for it. But eventually they call back and say, hey, this problem still hasn't gone away <laughs> because they need the education. And that's why I say the education is, is the way to go. Once builders know how easy this is to solve, it's so easy to solve. If it was something more complicated, I could see it. But when, I, but when you got a window cleaner up here explaining what's, what's going on here, I've gone to attorneys that don't know anything about glass at all. And within an hour, they understand the whole problem. And I have a lot of them interested in saying, hey, we need to do something about this. 
Why does this thing keep continuing? And we don't even scratch the surface of how big this thing is. There's probably thousands of guys getting popped on this and homeowners putting up with the glass and builders. Don't even scratch the surface. Uh, <clears throat> before you started, uh, before you start your uh, cleaning process, you test an area of glass with a razor blade to, to see if you hear the noise of possible uh, um, fabricating debris. Um, are there, and I've read on Gary's website and a couple other places where some other, he uses some other devices to check for um, f uh, fabricating debris. What are some of the things we can do to protect us besides the waiver to, so that we'll be able to tell something to our builders and, and contractors and things? In addition to the waiver, <clears throat> what you want to do is, is the second most important thing is, is you do not put yourself in a position where you are going to identify fabricating debris. You can do it, just like this window. I can do it. I can go out there and what I can do is say, yeah, fabricating debris is there and I can confirm it's there, but if I use a razor blade on a piece of glass and I don't hear it, I can't confirm it's not there. Because sometimes there's it's such a s small amount of it that you can't hear it and you clean your window and you can't see it and the sun comes out and you can't see it. But all of a sudden at 2.23 in the afternoon in April, the homeowner walks by and says, holy cow, where'd that come from? So it takes some special sunlight. But as far as helping your builder and, 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 and educate them, give them the information, and like I do, I go to my models and I, and I offer to use my services. I mean, I've already got the job, so the least I can do is help him out on that. So I go out and I, and I, I will do some testing for him. And I will confirm, yeah, it's there. These windows, without a doubt, get your glazer out here, get him to confirm it, get him to say, okay, we have the problem. If it becomes a problem on the job, we'll replace the glass for you. Let's leave it there for now and see if we can squeeze it on by, you know? And they can do what they want to do. And if they can squeeze it by and a guy only has to replace half of them, then, then so be it. But at least the glazer steps up at that point. And then if there's some that had just have a little bit that I wouldn't have picked up, I'm not taking liability. And I think that's one thing that Gary keeps pressing. The window cleaners can help out, but don't take liability. It's like in some contracts where they say it's our responsibility to show them the scratches before we start the window cleaning. I'm not going to sign something like that. Another thing, just so you guys know, I'm sure you all know about uh, deer season. You know, there, there's a certain time of the year for deer season. And there's, there's different sports you can do. I mean, there's duck season and deer season. and Well, there's also scratch glass season, too, if you're aware of that. But there is scratch glass season. Scratch glass season is April, May, and September, October, in this area anyway. In your part of the country, it might be a different area. But scratch glass season is when, the, when the, the scratches, you can see them and they're very evident. Right now, we're just now coming out of the scratch glass season where my phone rings off the hook during that season. And people think I'm, I'm crazy when I say this. But during these seasons, during the, the early spring, the sun is very low in the sky. So that sun is on that glass, that same glass all day long. And in the fall, you have the same thing. It's very low in the sky for many, many hours. Where in the winter, it's either cloudy or it's, it's out of sight. Or in the summer, same thing. You only have an hour, hour and a half. We have bright sun, then it's gone. And this fabricating debris scratches, you need sun 90% of the time to be able to see it. And, and, and when, when you have the right sun, it looks like someone took a belt sander to it. I mean, it, it's unbelievable, unmistakable. And a lot of people say, well, why didn't the window cleaner stop? There isn't a window cleaner in the land that wouldn't stop washing windows if he knew that was happening. So I feel it's a little condescending to say, why didn't he stop? We would stop. And I guarantee if we turn the sun off, you ain't going to see them scratches either. And as ASTM says, you can't inspect for scratches with any sunlight on the glass. No direct sunlight, perpendicular to the window, a certain distance back. That's ASTM standard. Well, you wouldn't see any of these. But as I said earlier, standards go right out the window when you have a owner, homeowner paying $5 million for a house. He's going to say, I don't care what the standards are. I bought this house on the lake so I could watch the sun set on the lake. 
and their lawyer will fire things up and get this thing settled. So anyway, the key is, is, is don't put yourself in between a problem where there's two very clear areas that needs to accept the lion's share of the responsibility. And I say to builders too, you know. And I say them because I know the builders can help us. The builders can help themselves if they just step up, understand what we're talking about here, and require the fabricators to put out a quality product or stop buying from them, which will put them out of business. Any more questions? Larry. So Dan, continuing on that uh, builder education theme, in my community there's um, a lot of owner builders who aren't exposing themselves to some of the information that maybe some of the medium to large folks who are involved in, say, a, a contractor's exchange in their area might be. Um, do you also get involved, or, or how would you suggest getting that educational word out there to a, 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 a greater cross-section of the builders in someone's area? Most of my, uh, my big glass scratch cases are with custom homes, uh, and it's because single homes and, and, and builders don't, or the single builder doesn't know. And unfortunately, when it does come up, we can't go to the house next door and, and, and do some testing over there because there isn't a house next door. Uh, but what I have done, uh, I, I've joined a home building association, trying to get a word out through there. But also what I've done with my bigger builders, uh, usually they have a customer service department. Now, customer service department meets uh, once a week or twice a month. And I actually uh, offered my services to actually go to their customer service meeting where they get all their customer service reps, all their contract people that write contracts and award contracts. And I had uh, a meeting with them, and I give the exact same seminar I'm giving here. And they're amazed. And you'd be surprised the number of times that if builders have gone back and the guys that are signing the checks pull out the old invoices, and they find out that 80% of the windows they're replacing are tempered when only 10% of the windows that are tempered in the house but yet 80% of the replacement glass is tempered. It just doesn't make any sense, you know? So it, it, that has helped a lot, but I know a lot of the associations are getting more involved with the home building associations, and I think that'll get the word out too. Uh, but bottom line, the word needs to get out. Heat needs to be put on uh, the, the, the people producing any product, you know?